Good morning, New Cuff. Uh, it's Pastor Jared here, and today we are going to continue our series, Digging Deeper, uh, as we look into Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. Uh, this past Sunday, Pastor uh, Scott brought a great message uh, with the central theme of finish the way you started. And so we saw in Galatians chapter 3, there was this tension between the law and the grace uh, that the Galatians were feeling, uh, and, and the two often seem to kind of be pitted against one another. And so uh, in verses 15 through 18 specifically, uh, we're going to see that Paul is going to utilize uh, some Old Testament scripture as well as some modern day uh, context, kind of bring home this idea of, uh, of grace uh, being the way to salvation, law serving a purpose uh, for a time, but it is ultimately about the grace uh, found in Jesus Christ for us to be saved. And so let's jump in. Uh, starting in verse 15 and following, here's what it says. It says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises, we were, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. So then it goes on to say in verses 17 and following, This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So I want us to jump into verse 15, and I want us to focus on a few things here. Um, Paul says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been Ratified, And so the, the phrase that I want to look at first is this idea of a covenant. And so if you guys are highlighters or circlers, go ahead and underline or circle uh, that word covenant right there. And so that this idea of covenant that, that Paul is bringing about for us, uh, I want us to think modern day kind of like a will or a trust. Um, Paul is talking about a, a will or a trust that has been set up between God and his people. And what he's saying here is that once a, a will or a trust uh, is, is made, uh, no one annuls it. Uh, once it has been ratified. And so that's the second word I want us to, to look at. And so basically what, what Paul is saying here in this idea is if the person who, who made a will or a trust uh, essentially passes away, that will or that trust is final. There is no changing it. And, and what Paul is, is wanting to understand by using this, this human example is um, in, in their culture and even our culture today, uh, we, we hold pretty firmly to this idea of, of people holding true to their promises uh, and then following through on their word. And so what Paul is, is saying here, and we're going to see here in a moment, is if, if we as, as finite, broken, sinful humans have this high standard of, of keeping a covenant, of keeping a promise, of fulfilling a will, fulfilling a trust, how much more so would God, who has promised it, keep up his ends of the bargain. So here's what he says in verse 16 and following. He says, Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. So a uh, word I want us to focus on first here is this idea of promises. So circle, underline, highlight that idea of, of promises. Paul is referring to the promise uh, that was made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 7. So if you're familiar with uh, scripture, um, God called Abram, uh, and here's actually that account uh, in verse or in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. A little lengthy, but it's important to understand what Paul is, is saying here. Here's what he says. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will. So you're going to see up here, and I want you guys to, to circle or highlight this idea of I will. I did it for us there, but there is a handful of I wills just in this passage alone. And so this idea of I will is God promising something. So he says, go to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And he continues on in verse 4 and following. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord. 
Again, this idea, Paul mentions singular offspring and this promise of I will. And so when we, when we think about this in, in the context of verse 16, now the promises, again, right? The promises were made to Abraham and to his singular offspring. So that's important for us to understand that, that Paul is bringing back these promises that God gave Abraham. Now, if you were to continue reading through Genesis uh, and were to go all the way into Genesis 22, the phrase, I will, from Genesis 12 to Genesis 22, appears almost a hundred times. In 10 chapters, God says over a hundred times, I will. So God makes this promise and makes it clear that he is going to do something through Abraham. And so we, we see here that this idea of, of offspring, um, now for us, we, we understand a little bit of uh, grammar and language, and so offspring um, can mean multiple, can mean many, uh, but, but Paul is saying here that it, it's not referring to many, but referring to one. I want you to circle that if you're a circular underliner, one. That in, in, in Genesis, when when God made this promise to, to Abraham about his offspring, um, he was referring to none other than Jesus Christ himself. That, that Jesus was always the plan from the beginning of time. And, and so Paul is wanting him to understand that it is Jesus Christ that this promise is fulfilled in. It is Jesus Christ that God was referring to when he promises this to Abraham. Now, yes, other parts of Abraham's offspring or offsprings would be blessed as well. You look through the ge genealogy of Abraham all the way to Jesus, you're going to see that there was blessing there. But the ultimate blessing, the ultimate promise came in the form of Jesus. So this means that, that the covenant that God was making with his people was not a biological one. It was Christological, meaning it was all focused on Jesus. In the next part uh, of Paul's argument, he brings out this idea of, of this timing of, of why is why is he going back to this promise um, to combat this idea of, of law and grace? So we see here in verse 17, it says, This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Uh, the key here I want us to focus on is this idea of 430 years afterward. Again, Paul is, is going back to some Old Testament uh, language and some Old Testament um, situations that the people would have been familiar with. And, and what Paul is likely referring to here is, is Genesis 46, verses 3 through 4. And here's what it says. It says, Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So this is, is a promise that he is making to Jacob. Uh, who would have been uh, Abraham's grandson. And, and so I want us to notice this, this idea of the God of your father. And he says, again, I will. So there's this promise. And, and so what uh, many commentators believe is, is happening here is, is this is the beginning of the covenants that God made with Abraham. This is the beginning of the promise being actualized that God made with Abraham. And so this 430 years, this is where it comes into play in, in Genesis uh, 46, 3 through 4. And then later on in Exodus 1240, we see this. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And so this 430 years that Paul was talking about was the time between the promise giving to Jacob and the time that they were in Egypt until they were uh, taken into the Exodus, right? And leaving Egypt and then wandering in desert. So this 430 years that, that Paul is referring to is the time between the, the promise given to Jacob and the time that, that God would give the law to Moses during Exodus. And so what he's trying to say here is, he's thinking if, if the promise was given first to Abraham, it cannot be undone by what was given to Moses. Uh, and as we you know, look further into uh, chapter 3, before we keep reading, we're, we're going to see that the law served a purpose to, to guide and protect the people until the fulfillment of the promise, but the law itself was not the promise. 
Because here's what Abraham says, or sorry, here's what uh, Paul says in verse 18 of Galatians 3. He says, For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. And so there's a couple of key words here that I want us to think about. This idea of inheritance, the idea of but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. And so the reason why this is important is when we think about uh, an inheritance in, in modern day times for us, an inheritance is something that is just simply given. Um, you do not earn an inheritance um, that you simply receive it because of the one who is giving it. Uh, it is essentially a promise. Uh, you belong to this family, therefore you will get this. And in, in the same way that, that Abraham belonged to God and God was giving him this promise, this inheritance uh, to be had, to be received, to be taken. And, and so God made this, this promise to him. And what we need to understand is, is this was not based on, on Abraham's deeds. This was not based on his lifelong obedience. Uh, this was not based on anything other than God's own good pleasure and love. That God simply gave this to Abraham. And so when we think about this and, and what Paul is saying in, in Galatians 3 as we wrestle with this tension of, of law and grace, there's a few things that I want us to, to walk away with uh, today. The first is this. In Christ, you are a beneficiary of God's promise. That Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise, and in Christ, you and I can receive that promise. The second thing is that salvation is the inheritance and fulfillment of the promise. The ultimate end of all of it is salvation and then glorification when Jesus comes back, and that is the inheritance that you and I will receive. And lastly, the inheritance is received, not earned. You and I have done nothing to earn it. We've done nothing to deserve it. It is simply something we receive um, through the goodness and grace of God. It's a gift that we take uh, when we uh, place our faith in, in Jesus Christ. And, and what we need to understand is what, what Paul is uh, pulling at here is, is that the law says do this when, when grace and the promise says accept this. And, and so for us to, to know is that, you know, right after this, Paul's going to go on to say, hey, the, the law had a purpose. And the law was, was meant to guide and, and protect and, and do all those things for us. Um, but rather than, than focusing on, on the law, uh, he's saying, hey, focus on the grace. And that doesn't mean that we just throw out the law. We just do whatever we want uh, because obedience is our response to God's goodness of the inheritance. That, that we are gladly obedient to God uh, because of the, the gift that he has given us in the person of Jesus. And so uh, this, this day I want us to, to rest assured that our salvation is a gift. Um, it's something that's simply been given, something that we can receive gladly, not something we earn. And, and, and my hope for us is that the receiving of that salvation, the receiving of that gift, of that inheritance would then push us to be people of obedience and thankfulness and gratitude and a spirit of worship for what God has done for us. Let me pray for us and then we'll be done. Father God, we thank you for your gift. God, we thank you for the inheritance. God, we think that there's nothing that we can do to, to lose what we have not earned. So, Lord, would you just allow your spirit to, to make that truth known to us, Father, that we can rest assured that our inheritance is sure uh, because, because Jesus is sure. So, Father, all we need to do is accept that. So, Lord, would we, would we cease striving and place our faith in that inheritance, in that promise? God, will we then be obedient to you as a response? God, would you be glorified? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great day.